What's up guys? Welcome back to Storytime with Uncle Reddit. My name's John and this is r slash Tales from Tech Support. Video number two for the day. Trying to get ahead a little bit. We got a couple times that we're going to be out and about traveling and uh, I want to make sure that we have enough episodes to cover everything. So time to start knuckling down and getting ahead of the curve here. And with a little luck, maybe I'll be able to record something on the road too, just as a kind of a bonus. All right, let's get into the stories. Non-IT experts. One from not so long ago now. At the start of COVID, everyone at the office was sent home. For a third of the workforce, this wasn't an issue as we had a good VPN system and they had laptops. As IT, we got the task of getting laptops to everyone else. Overtime was available as much as you wanted. We set about creating the laptops and shipping them out. Of course, the number of tickets raised by the users went up exponentially. Most of them did not have a clue what a VPN was, so for the next few weeks we were mopping up the problems. One particular one kept catching my eye. It was assigned to various different engineers but kept being reopened. We had a BT, British Telecom, call system, like a VOIP through the PC with WYSI features. This particular user could not get it to work. As each tech had a go at fixing it, the problem never got sorted. Eventually I was co-opted in and assigned the ticket. I read the ticket trail. Pretty much everything had been tried and at this point the user's manager was kicking up a massive stink. So I got on the phone with the user and tested various things. I couldn't find anything. As a last resort, I asked the user to test the software while connected to her phone's hotspot instead of her own Wi-Fi. It worked. Are you a gamer? I asked. Yes, she said. A pretty high ranking one. And have you opened and closed ports to improve the gaming performance on your router? She had. When asked to reset the router, she point blank refused. So I had to email her manager saying that until the home unit is reset or another connection put in, there was nothing we could do. The ticket closed the next day. So basically, she's putting her gaming ahead of her work schedule. Can't say I really blame her too much, but who's paying for the internet service? If it's you paying for the internet service and you're required to have internet service for your job, they should either be reimbursing you for it or straight up paying for another second service put in somehow. I'm not truly sure how any of that would work, but in my eyes, if my if my job required me to have a cell phone on me during the day, they better hand me one before I go out on the field on the job. If they require me to have internet service at home and it wasn't predetermined that I was going to pay for my own service to do the work for their company, they better pay to have a line put in my house. That just seems like common sense to me, but eh, maybe I'm thinking about it wrong. I don't know. Ever had to apologize to customers because their own company forgot to pay their internet bills? So a few years back, the company I worked at contracted me as IT support for this other company, and they had a network specialist who took care of all their internet bills. The dude quit the company without handing over his duties correctly, and they just forgot that they had internet bills to pay somehow. A whole site was isolated for a day and then had to run on a much, much slower secondary link for a month until they figured out how to pay the bills again. The entire time, we'd get calls from users at the site telling us that their applications aren't connected to the server, or it's too slow and they can't work. And just to save the face of the company, we had to sit and apologize, telling them that we're working to get it back up as soon as possible. Lol. Thinking back, I feel I should have just burst their bubbles on each of those calls. Yeah, I wouldn't eat crap for that mess. Go talk to your bosses. They didn't pay their bills, so, uh, yeah, it's not on us. What would you guys do? Would you just blurt right out that, you know, it wasn't your company that caused the issue, it's their company? And that maybe they should go talk to their higher-ups? Or would you just kind of keep it quiet and apologize just to keep the water smooth for that phone call? Let me know down below. I'm a sysadmin, not a psychic. Me, Chaka Toy, Chaka Toy, now sysadmin and only IT person on site. Rest of IT is all over the country. Therefore, also IT support level 1, 2, and 3. OL equals office lady, one of my bureaucracy wrestling colleagues. Nice, but pretty oblivious to all things IT. Monday morning, the summer heat has not yet reached its feverish peak, but the sun is already annoyingly hot. I arrive at work after public transit related delays and immediately there's a first problem. Me. Morning. Office lady. Morning. Listen, I'm having trouble with the Wi-Fi. I managed to make it work somehow by using a different one, but can you take a look? Me. Uh, sure. What's the issue? I listen to her explanation and take a brief look. No, I need my morning routine. Me. Okay, I'll take care of it, but I really need to get to my office first. Office lady. But then I can't use XYZ. Me. That's why I'll come back down and take a look as soon as I'm done. I just got here. Please give me just a moment. Morning routine. Arrive at work, wash my hands, evacuate bowels, wash hands, start PC, check tickets, mails, and PMs, get water and coffee. 
I forgo the coffee for now to deal with what sounded like a minor issue and return to Office Lady's office. The Wi-Fi splash page says, wrong username and password. The usual spiel follows. Are you sure you're using the right password? She says yes. Rule number one, users always lie, even when they don't know it. Have you tried restarting your laptop? No, she hasn't. Rebooting laptop. Which password? The one you set when we did the Wi-Fi for you last week? I see the notebook she uses to write down her various passwords open on her desk. I look away because I'm anal about password security, including hypocrisy when it comes to my own. I tell everyone not to leave their passwords laying around in the open, but I'm too under-caffeinated to reprimand her right now. The one the browser filled out might be the wrong one. Try the ones you wrote down. It works once she uses the correct password. Who to thunk? I turn to leave. Office lady. But will it work tomorrow when I start my laptop? Me. It should. Office lady. But will it automatically connect correctly? Me. As far as I know it should. Office lady. But can I be sure? Me. Look, I'm not a psychic. There could be a problem tomorrow, but as far as I can see right now, there shouldn't be. If there's a problem, just tell me and we'll fix it together. She's more or less satisfied with my answer and I return to my office. I don't give out promises like that because when there is a problem, it's, but IT said, time again. I had several of these, I'm a doctor, not a XYZ moments in my short time as sysadmin already. So far, I have not been an electrician, engineer, audio tech, and probably a couple more things I forgot. Might write more tales from tech support about those. Yeah, I mean, she sounds a little clueless, but I can't help but think something's nagging at me. She wants to turn on her laptop and have everything automatically already connected. It doesn't sound like she wants to try to log in at all. And I have a feeling that, you know, maybe your company's different, I don't know. But in all the companies I've been with and organizations, you have to physically type in your username and password every single time. There is no like... Like when I get on the internet here and do things here, I have a lot of things saved and set to auto, you know, connect, auto log in, whatever. And for me at home, that's one thing, but in an office environment, eh, not so much. Am I thinking about this wrong? I don't know. Let me know down below. I know I don't have to say that. You guys are going to tell me anyway, and I appreciate that because sometimes I'm just clueless myself and it's nice to have the actual answers. You want documentation? Sure thing. I don't know why my brain just reminded me of this thing I did at my first job about 18 years ago. God, I feel old. But I thought you might enjoy it. Right after uni, I started working for a financial institution as institution. Wow, that's a hard word. As IT support. I studied, applied mathematics, and had some experience programming. I was the one who did most of the coding for our group projects. So another classmate recommended me for that position. And even though I had zero background in IT, I got hired. The role was mostly macro coding, automating menial tasks that people spent hours on, on top of providing system support. My mother would often tell me that I was costing people their jobs by automating their work, but that's a discussion for another time. Due to some health issues and me wanting to do a master's and eventually move to the academic sector, I put in my notice after only 9 months. By then I had created dozens of macros and scripts and my office must have liked my job because they kept trying to get me to stay. Since I was going to leave in a few weeks, there was no point in me taking on more of these automation projects, so I spent most of my days doing nothing since the system support part of my role rarely had issues, because all the automation we did previously, which would reduce the human error. The IT manager wanting to make the most of my time left was always trying to get me to do things, and one of these things was to document all the processes I had created. Now, as I said, I had zero background in computer sciences, aside from coding mathematical models. I wouldn't hear the words repository, version control, commits, scrum, etc. until four years later. So when I asked what documenting meant, I was told just add comments to your code to explain what each routine and function does. So I just did that. I commented every single line of code. Because I enjoyed using some clever tricks to reduce the amount of code or improve the number of operations, some comments would be useful in explaining what the hell I was doing, but most of the comments were pointless. For example, closing a for loop, I just added and repeat the same for the next iteration. I never got sat down to do a proper handover, which four years later I learned was meant to be the correct practice, so I can only imagine the reaction of the poor soul that inherited my code upon trying to debug it for the first time. I am one of the most inept people when it comes to code of any kind that I know. For a little while I taught myself HTML, HTML5, all that stuff when I was working for the Board of Ed and I had a special ed student who was my charge at the time and he loved that kind of stuff. Kid was a math wizard. He kept numbers in his head. He was very, well, 
For math things, he was logical thinking. Socially, not so much. But anyway, this kid ran circles around me the first two days um, and then forever. But, you know, I tried starting to create macros for myself on my computer, and I don't do a ton of stuff that would need macros. But I thought maybe they would be useful for certain daily tasks that I do, and I don't know. I have a hard time. It's so abstract to my pea brain that I have a hard time getting my head around it. But uh, I may try again at some point. Right now, one of my sons is uh, learning Python online and something else. I don't remember. But anyway, so I think he I think he enjoys coding enough and sitting there at the computer all day that I think he would enjoy going into doing programming, coding, something like that. Good for him. I'm more of a tactile, hands-on, hammer and nails kind of guy. So I do what I can with tech, but uh, some of this stuff just escapes me. How I quit the job I had at the beginning of lockdown. I was working at a bank with a 300 person call center that all ran thin clients, connected to a Citrix desktop environment. When the lockdown order happened, we sent all 300 users home with instructions, find your home computer, install Citrix workspace on it, and connect to this site in Citrix workspace. No knock on these people, but their call center, they're not qualified to install Citrix workspace on whatever hardware they have at home. The number of POS devices that got pulled out of closets to attempt to connect to work was amazing. I'm not a Mac guy, but we had one on the team. He got all the Mac calls, but the rest of us had to try to explain to the users why their Windows 7, Windows ME, Windows CE notebooks won't work. That's prior to the network quality issues. And to make this environment even more lovely, our VPN app at the time had this lovely habit of failing to change the DNS provider when you would connect to a VPN. So our users that did have their own laptops had a common issue that took 10 to 15 minutes at the best of times and with an uncooperative user got far, far worse. I still have holes in my wall from the call where I quit that job. Karen, name changed to protect the guilty, though I still remember her first and last name perfectly well, called with the DNS issue she was trying to convince me that the fix was too technical for her. I'm too old to do this stuff. I'm not a whiz kid like you guys. I responded, ma'am, I got my first pair of glasses during the Nixon administration. <laughs> I was too. She then came back with, well, I don't have your years of fancy schooling. Me, ma'am, I have a GED and two semesters of community college. She then changed tack to, you will schedule me a face-to-face -face technician meeting. The company had created a tech support kiosk two months before the lockdown. After half a dozen rounds of that, I picked up my chair and threw it across the room, found my glasses, booked her face to face, packed up my equipment, walked into that kiosk and dropped it off and that's the last call I took at that job. Fast forward to today, I'm working in the same downtown. I've seen one or two coworkers from that job and my current job is moving in 2025 to the same building as that job. Looking forward to that. I might say some self deprecating stuff on this channel once in a while but I mean I know I'm not stupid. I, I do have a hard time with certain concepts because that's not where I apply myself. This guy, I mean, with, you know, a GED, which is what I got, uh, some community college, which is what I got. He dove into computers and that's where he applied himself and that's where he kept going and going and going. I did it with construction stuff when I was younger. Uh, so I have a knack for building things, fixing things, working through problems that way, troubleshooting more mechanical things. In construction math, I mean, I can lay out stairs and rafters the old school way with no problem at all, but that would escape a lot of other people. It's funny when people, you know, call in and try to use the excuse of, oh, I'm not like you young whippersnappers. I can't do this stuff. I'm too old. Well, I'm not too old. It's just not something where I put my energy into. So yeah. As for throwing your chair across the room, I've had that moment myself in the past and I've tried to contain that for the most part, because being the carpenter in the house and doing all those hands-on things, I'm the guy that's got to fix all that crap. So, yeah. I hate winter. So this is a much more recent story than my last one. It involves a highly qualified IT person and me, so the company moved to a new warehouse during the final round of lockdowns because of COVID. We've been getting ready for this move for about six months, build works, setting up the network, etc. A room was set aside for the new server room. It has its own air conditioning, is dust free, and we put it on its own electrical distribution board. All good. The three servers get installed, switches, broadband connection, backup connection, VOIP, extra cable for POI cameras, and expansion of the business. Most importantly, UPS to continue operations until power's back on or generator brought into operation. So you have a rough background. 
IT person likes to come in well before our day starts so he can check backups and make sure our invoicing is okay. It's just starting winter here in Australia. So the server room is a bit cold. Servers are happy, he is not. Brings in a little blow heater to put under his desk for a little warmth. Trips the circuit for the three servers and comes to me because the UPSs are beeping. By the time I got to the server room, the servers were about two minutes from shutting down and closing our operations. I reset the circuit breakers and looked for the reason why they tripped and found his little bit of comfort. The heater got its plug removed, IT got instructions again on how to set the climate control, and I've gone around and removed any plug-in heater in the building. Remember, it's not only the users that need work instruction, application of hammer. Some of that was a little confusing for me to read, but anyway, um, we used to have that problem. We had a, an office. We got a really good deal on this office, which part of that meant that there wasn't really enough receptacles and power to power everything that everybody wanted. And, you know, we had enough for all the computers. We had enough infrastructure for the phones, dial up for internet and everything else. But when it came to extra stuff like, you know, personal space heaters, personal little drink refrigerators, things like that, mm -mm, that was a no go. In fact, our main refrigerator was downstairs in the warehouse of the fencing company who we rented our space from uh, so that they could run our refrigerator for us. We, we weren't totally pushing the limits, but, you know, I think the refrigerator would have brought us really close to that tipping point. And, you know, the office ladies would always complain they were cold. But while I'm in the office, we don't have clients in the office, so I didn't mind. I could, I could take off my button down on my tie and get down to a t-shirt. I was at least respectful enough to, you know, have sleeves on my t-shirt. But anyway, um, and they could bundle up a little bit and we could turn the heat up a little bit. Now, we didn't want to turn it up a lot. We didn't have the computers that, you know, you guys are talking about, like whole server rooms that would heat up like an oven. But, uh, you know, we could make everybody fairly comfortable and adjust, but they always refused. They always swore that we were trying to freeze them out, blah, blah, blah. Men are always hotter than women and everything like that. I tried to accommodate. This was an office that I helped run, and I wasn't, I mean, I set the temperature at 75. I'm not sure how much higher they wanted it, but it was ridiculous, and our fuel costs were going through the roof. Yeah, there was two two women. One was a receptionist, and one was a uh, sales coordinator, and uh, they would always set up little heaters under their desk thinking they were getting away with something until the office went dark. Now, I didn't have any control over putting in extra receptacles or, or increasing the power to that part of the building so that we could actually accommodate other things. But either way, I still wouldn't have approved the extra space heaters because they always forgot to turn them off when they left in the afternoons to go home. Talk about a fire hazard. Uh, yeah, with cords hanging down there, loose papers that fell off their desk, their sweater that they left hanging on the back of their chair when they left, which if you're cold, why would you take your sweater off? Anyway... Uh, they'd swivel their chair around and it would be facing, you know, 10 inches away from the space heater. And yeah, just didn't make any sense. But yeah, what do I know? Don't tell me computers can't learn. Just realized this one today. So I've got a small stack, five or six, of Dell laptops in my POE that need various hardware warranty repair that I haven't gotten around to in a while. As one of my rocks, I've been tasked with getting all the machines under warranty working and all the out of warranty recycled. So I put my queue of warranty machines in a spare cube and figure I'll call in one repair a week, get this taken care of with minimal fuss. First machine has no power condition. No cables will power this machine. USB-C ports are of the devil, so Tech comes out with a new system port. I point him at his patient and go back to Reddit. A few minutes later I hear loud square wave beeping. I assume it was a beep code. I hear a few more. Then I hear a phone call for 10 to 15 minutes. Then the Tech interrupts me and lets me know he's not going to be able to fix this right now. Would I like him to come back out or do a depot? Start the depot. No problem. Tech leaves. Now here's the spooky bit. All that was last Thursday and Friday. Today I go back in that cube, start going through the remaining machines that need warranty repair for various no boot conditions. Except suddenly they're all booting. Even the one that took a coffee with cream and sugar bath three months ago. The one that wouldn't get through PXE boot without a BSOD. Suddenly, image is no problem. Don't tell me computers can't learn. I don't think I've ever had that with a computer. Once it starts going downhill, yeah, it just keeps going downhill until either I figure it out or pay somebody else to do it. But with cars, now I've had cars. I'll, I'll have a car. It sounds like, you know, it's got a pulley about to take off right out the front grill of my truck and I'll get it into the garage and the mechanic can't recreate the sound. I'll even point to the pulley that was the offender and tell him, listen, loosen the tension or take the belt off feel the pulley with your hands you can you, you know when you spin it you can feel the thing grinding like it's dead and it's still it would spin free and just like you just lubed it up i have no idea why to this day but eventually 
I got tired of messing around with him and put a new one on myself and everything was fine. But, uh, yeah, every time I would take something in for a rattle or a thump or a steering problem, all of a sudden the mechanic sits in the driver's seat and the damn thing starts to behave. It's enough to make you drink. All right, guys, thanks for sharing a little bit of your day with me today. I appreciate you being here. And if you enjoyed this video or podcast, whatever format you're on, do me a favor. If you stuck around this long, you might as well leave us a like, subscribe, leave a review, right? Right? All right, I'll see you guys on the next one.